Hello and welcome to the Sage Advice Podcast. Today we have a very special guest. It is Ariel Aquinas. Hi. Hello. Thank you so, so much for coming and being on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. It's so good to see your face again. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> So why don't we start by you can describe a little bit like what you've done with regards to the sex industry and sex work. Uh, I started out just like a regular model, but I knew that I wanted to be a fetish model. I knew I had wanted to be like an all porn model because back, you know, when I was coming up, that was kind of like what was really in at that time is the, you know, alt girl websites. And that was the first time I'd ever seen women who looked like me being portrayed as sexy and beautiful because when I was growing up in the, you know, early nineties, early two thousands, it was still kind of the, the regular Pam Anderson, Pam Anderson, Jenny Jameson, that skinny, big boobs, body type, blonde, which is so funny because now I'm blonde with big boobs, but. <laughs> but <laughs> Never I saw that coming, huh? I did not see that coming, but at the time I was a weird goth kid. And so to see weird goths, you know, being sexy and beautiful and the fact that people were paying to see them just really like changed my entire perception of myself. So I started out doing that. Uh, I think the first website I was on was bellavendetta.com, which was like one of those self-submit websites and it was all kind of fetish content and I'm still friends with her to this day, you know, but that site's long gone. Um, and then I'd moved on to doing like little fetish videos and I was a professional dominatrix for many years. And then I started working for a spanking website because at the time I had this really huge ass and huge, huge asses on white girls were like not even a thing yet. So yeah. the, the, you know, the spanking websites, you know, really wanted me. And then I started doing cosplay and parody porn and that's where, you know, it really kind of took off and I got into mainstream porn from there. And what are you doing now? I mean, are you still participating in mainstream porn at all? Or do you have your own things going on? Like what's your status kind of? So right now my status is semi-retired. I what? haven't done any partnered scenes in I think almost two years. I don't even shoot a lot. Like I just don't like being on video right now. So I do a lot of sexting. I do um, dancing for like private bachelor parties here in Vegas but I'm not doing any filming right now. Yeah, like content. Right, yeah, no no content, especially with other people. Yeah, so uh, still keeping your f at least one foot in the sex work style of making money, but not really in performance. Right, I, I love the industry. I didn't wanna leave. Um, and I never expected, you know, to leave. It was kind of circumstances outside of my control forced me to stop <laughs> filming. And so, you know, it's learning to navigate life now, not doing the thing that I had been doing for, you know, like most of my adult life, but then, you know, also, you know, finding out what life is like outside of doing porn specifically, but still being in the industry that I'm comfortable with and that I've been in for so long. So, you know, I, I definitely would probably keep a foot in the industry forever <laughs> if I can, if, you know, the government <laughs> credit card companies, you know, let us exist yeah. for much longer. Right. Yeah. It's, it's very frustrating. <laughs> in yes, absolutely. Uh, the crusaders, uh, people crusading against the type of, joy that we like to bring the world. Um, <laughs> That's a great way to put it, too. Yeah. <laughs> but um, so, yeah, so you're still uh, you're still doing your own stuff. I mean, do you have your own like uh, OnlyFans type thing? You mentioned Sex Panther. Yeah. So I have OnlyFans. I have many vids still. Um, I don't mm -hmm. update them super, super often. It's more 
uh, you know, I'm using it as like an archive of all of my old stuff. You know, I've still got hundreds yeah. and hundreds of old photos and videos up and a way for fans to talk to me and contact me and buy, you know, I'll send out care packages and stuff. I'm sending out like Christmas care packages, you know, right now to fans. And so that's a way, you know, for them to contact me because my, my DMs, just like most people, my DMs are closed everywhere because if they weren't, it would just be, I'd be answering messages all day long and I'd never get anything yeah. else done. Cause I did that yeah. for years. I did that for years and I finally had to be like, okay, I can't, you know, I can't handle the mental labor of answering messages 24 hours a day. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty much impossible. It's, it's always surprising to me, <laughs> like on my OnlyFans, you know, I'll maybe message someone once and then I'm like, oh, I got to go like live my life for a couple days and then come back to OnlyFans. And there's like, a question mark, two question marks. Yes. What happened, baby? Question mark, another question mark. Oh, are you mad at me? Did I say something wrong? Just like, oh, oh my God. and it, it'll be like four <laughs> o'clock in the morning, and I'm like, I gotta yeah. sleep, my guy. <laughs> exactly. I'm like, no, it's just that wherever you live, I live in a different part of the world, and like, also just. I, I have a life too. Like I, yeah, I I'd love if I was, I got if I was just a, do. yeah. Like I, I would love to just be a robot for your sexual needs at every waking moment, but I am not. So yeah, literally that's one of my exact fetishes, but I, <laughs> it's a fantasy for a reason. You know, I like to go back a little bit and let's start with, at what point in your life did you realize or how did you realize like that pornography was a thing? Like what was your introduction to that? So my very first introduction to pornography, I, I was pretty young and a friend of mine had found one of her dad's videotapes because I'm old. So he, he had videotapes and it was called like Sugar Bitches. And Ooh, Sugar Bitches. Yeah. And it was this old like... It had to be from the 70s. Everyone was real furry. Yeah. And I believe it was a bisexual, like male, male, female threesome video, which I think took me many years to wrap my head around because I didn't know that that was even possible. <laughs> you know, at the at the time, I had no idea. And yeah. it's so funny because now I've had so many male, male, female by threesomes. That's like my yeah. favorite thing in the world. And I always wonder, like, is it because of sugar bitches that I love it? But it was one of those things. We thought it was going to be like a comedy movie because it had a funny title. And we sugar put it bitch. on. And the first thing we see, it's this close up of like super hairy genitals, like pounding into each other. And we didn't know what it was. And we just start screaming, like very classic, like, ah. <laughs> And we turn it off <laughs> and then we kept, you know, like, and then she'd be like, I'm going to turn it on. I'd be like, no, don't turn it on. And then she'd turn it on and we'd be like, ee, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yes. And, you know, and so it took me a long time to like, it took us a long time to figure out like what we were seeing. And then even yeah. when, you know, like they zoomed out and I saw all three of them going at it, I was like, how is the guy reaching the girl from behind that guy? You know, right. like I just couldn't, uh -huh. you know, figure out what I was seeing. So that was my very, very first, very first, like, porno video. And was it, I mean, you mentioned it's a little shocking, kind of, but was it intriguing at the same time? Like, because personally, I do think that that probably has some influence on the fact that you enjoy boy, boy, girl, threesome videos, right? It was, it was scary, but yeah, it was intriguing in the fact that we could tell that this was something we were not supposed to see. Right. And were you afraid of getting caught in, the, in that moment? Like, I, I don't think we were afraid of getting caught. I think her okay. parents weren't home for some reason. But yeah. it was one of those things where like, she would like, I remember she called, I went home and she called me on the phone and she was like, there is something happening. Like, it was like, this girl is sucking two wieners at once. You have to see that. And I was just like, two wieners at once? How is it possible? You know, like, I just couldn't believe it. Yes. So, of course, I had to walk back over to her house so I could see the two wieners at once happening because I, I just mean, couldn't imagine it. 
Yeah, you have to see to believe, right? <laughs> Absolutely. And now, ever since, I have sucked two wieners myself, so I can tell you for sure it's a real thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've, I've, I've at least seen it once or twice. <laughs> so from there, like, what was your – you? I would assume or imagine that maybe you experimented at some point before you decided to – get into this kind of work yourself or before you were old enough to do so. Um, yeah. Well, like your, your personal exploration of your sexuality and what sort of led you to be an exhibitionist, I will say. <laughs> Can so, you tell me a little bit about that? Absolutely. Well, so I've always been a performer. I was, yeah. Tell like, me about that. I was always like a theater nerd. I was in all the plays like from Same. elementary school on, I was in every single play. I was yes. on the speech and drama team. I have always, I always wanted to be an actor. And so, Same. You know, yeah. so I always tell people, I'm like, technically I did fulfill my childhood dream. <laughs> and Ariel, just, <laughs> hold on a second. I just have to say that you are the only other person who's ever said that to me because like, I say that too, because when I was a kid, I was just like, I, I'm going to be a porn star when I grow up. That's what I'm going to do. Like, when I, seriously, when I was in like middle school and yeah. I, and I always say, I'm like, I'm like the only person I know that grew up to do exactly what I wanted to do with my life. And you're the only other person that has ever said that to me. So uh, no, hell yeah. I, have, I have heard that time solidarity. And time. I have heard that time and time again, but no, oh, I, wow. even when I was, you know, I think, 12 or 13 and i know i'm not the only one with this exact experience there was an episode of the original csi and it had a dominatrix named lady heather and i remember <laughs> seeing that when i was in middle school and i was like oh that's what i want to do when i grow up i want to be a dominatrix you know yes. like i you know because it was like the first time i was like oh that thing that's in my mind that i want to do that's a real thing that people do. Oh, I'm going to yes. do that. And so I knew from you know, middle school, I was like, I'm going to be a dominatrix. That's what I'm going to do. Hell yes. And then I decided to be like, not necessarily in porn, but doing adult content when I was around 16, I mm -hmm. think. Because like at the time, there was this big divide between like, Yes, I'm posting my nudes online for men to jerk off to, but it's not porn because mm -hmm. X, Y, Z reason, you know, and eventually yeah. we all had to get over ourselves and be like, yeah, we're doing. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> like, like yeah, we're doing porn. But um, so, yeah, it was so I my first sexual exploration was pretty, you know, I guess it was pretty weird, but also pretty simple. It would just be like watching Girls Gone Wild commercials in the middle of the night, you know, and like kind of like, I would just like stick anything in my vagina to see if it did something. I, you know, Hell yes. like- the And did it? No, it did nothing. Like, you know- I know. Like plastic play food, a pencil, yeah. like just whatever. I was just sticking stuff in there because I didn't know how masturbation worked. And actually- Same, yeah. People find it really bizarre, but I- was never able to make myself come until I was in my like late teens, like 16, 17 years old. I couldn't figure yeah. it out forever. Yeah. And it was actually porn that helped me figure it out because I, <gasps> well, because number one, I also didn't know about like clit stimulation versus internal. I thought that internal yep. was just like what it was. Yeah. And I even like, I had a boyfriend who had like made me come from oral but I still couldn't figure it out myself. And then one day, because you know, you get like spam emails like a lot in the early 2000s, all these spam porn emails. And I was looking yeah. at one and there was a video and a girl stuck her hand in her panties and started kind of like rubbing herself. And I was like, oh, I'm getting the feeling. Like the feeling mm -hmm. like when I'm with my boyfriend and I'm like gonna come, like I'm getting that feeling. So yes. I, I just watched that video over and over and kind of like rub myself and it happened and I was like, and once I figured it out, I <laughs> did not stop. And, and this was back in the day when like your only computer was your family computer in the living room. So I yep. had to have it like timed out perfect where like I get home, jerk off a few times, like make sure that the screen is blank by the time my mom opens the door. Like yes. I would also, I would jerk off to all kinds of stuff. I had this like 
I'd found this book at my grandma's house and it was like, it was a textbook. It was like the history of erotic, like fantasy or something. And, or it, the history of erotic literature. And so it was all these mm. dirty stories from like Victor- Victorian times. And I would try and jerk off to that. Like oh, that sounds hot. Hell yeah. <laughs> Quizilla, I love that. There, there was this website, Quizilla, where you could take these quizzes, but sometimes they would like tell a dirty story. I'd try and jerk off to that. Like, yeah. Two second clips, you know, of like girls eating each other out, just like whatever I could get my hands on. I was trying to jerk off to it. I was obsessed. Yes. It sounds like we're the same age. But yeah, it was the same. Like it was the one family computer. Yep. It was very, very slow, of course. But (laughs) when the Internet first came around, it was like my parents had no fucking clue what that was all about. And so it was the Wild West back then. Yeah, it's the Wild West. So I was like, they'd be in bed and they're like, okay, you have fun on the internet. We're going to bed. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. Oh, and I did. And I'm I having fun. did. <laughs> Honestly, thank God. And I'm actually really grateful. So this kind of leads into the next phase. So when I was like 16, 17, I had my high school sweetheart and he was the guy I lost my virginity to. And he was like, a, he was obsessed with porn. And he had all kinds of weird kinks, even though he was a virgin too. So my my first sexual experimentation was like real weird, like role play kind of stuff. Wow. Yeah. Advanced. Oh yeah. Really, really strange role play. And then, you know, and the first thing I learned was like how to deep throat because he was like, well, this is how the girls, because all he knew about sex was from porn. And I I remember I got really jealous because I was like, he has a girlfriend. Why does he need to look at other women? Why does he need to jerk off to porn when he's got me and I have sex with him maybe once a month? You know, why does he? (laughs) And please explain why. (laughs) And so I find, you know, I finally I got brave one day and I was like, I'm going to look it up to see why these girls are so much better than me. And it was like, suicide girls or god's girls or something and that's mm-hmm. when i was like these girls are me oh yes. my god and i had always thought i was so ugly i had always you know i never thought i was like sexy i never thought people would find me attractive and so to see these women you know like i said being portrayed as sexy and sexy enough that people want to pay for it totally changed my perception of myself like yes. i had no self-esteem And all of a sudden I was like, holy crap, like people might find me attractive and I might be, you know, like worthwhile, you know, and like I might be sexy and people might desire me like, you know, it it literally never occurred to me in my life, like ugly duckling for sure. And so I kind of decided right then I was like, okay, I'm going to do this because I want other people to have that moment where they see me on screen and they're like, hey, that's me. You know, like, uh, so, you know, it was, and people were, when I would do uh, interviews for years and years, people would get disappointed because they wanted a salacious, like, why did you get into porn? And they wanted me to be like, just because I love dicks, you know, and I'm so horny. (laughs) Yeah. And not, you know, like, I want to give little girls (laughs) self-esteem. Yeah, totally, totally. (laughs) Yeah. But I mean, of course, uh, I think that's for, for a lot of us, um, getting into this type of work was just a revelation in a lot of ways because, you know, I think we all have insecurities all throughout our life, but Mm -hmm. when we get into this type of work and it's like, but here are all of these people reaching out to me, wanting me and telling me that I'm pretty and all this other stuff and uh, have like sexual value and sort of opening my eyes to that in ways that like I couldn't do on my own. Like you can't do it just looking in the mirror, judging yourself, but other people telling you like, not even just telling you like, oh, you're so pretty, but just like wanting you and showing that. Absolutely. And I mean, that was really crucial for me. I mean, you know, obviously like I don't base my entire validation on people finding me attractive, but of course, as being, I was the funny fat friend my entire life. I remember (laughs) one of my friends in middle school, uh, he was asked to pick who we would date between me and my friend. And instead of just picking, he made sure to add on that he would rather jump in front of a train than date me. Uh, Wow. 
you know, so it was like people had been really cool to me, re, you yeah. know, like really made me feel super, super ugly my entire life. So to finally, like, I, I kind of needed that outside source of people being like, no, you're attractive because it was just so hard for me to believe because I had been told the exact opposite my entire existence. Yeah, totally. So now, so now you have this, you've, well, did you, I'm just curious now about the boyfriend thing. Like, did you get beyond that feeling of getting jealous when, that he would jerk off to people who were not you? Yeah, yeah. Or, I, once I started jerking off to porn, I really couldn't be mad at him about it. <laughs> so, you know, we, we got chill on that. And the funny thing is, like, I am naturally polyamorous. I've always been polyamorous in my relationships literally since like I had a little boyfriend in kindergarten he had another girlfriend and we were cool with it but yeah. it was, but it was like with my first boyfriend it was like that expectation that I should be jealous and right. so I was because it was also kind of a status thing where he had never dated anyone but me not because people didn't want to date him because he was like the king of the goths he was beautiful like everybody wanted him so bad and he had never been interested in anyone until he met me like people wow. thought he was gay, you know, so like I felt really special. And then to find out like actually he was attracted to other people, then that was kind of a hit to my ego. But right. No, yeah, we we eventually moved past that and had a very strange relationship up until I my freshman year of college when I literally met my husband. My high school sweetheart sat in front of me, my husband sat behind me. And, yeah. That's and, so cute. It just so happened, like the way the numbers worked out, that my husband was my study buddy for the class. And I asked him if he wanted to come over and study, you know, come over to my dorm and study. And he didn't leave for 15 years. So, oh my God. <laughs> we've literally lived together since our like first date. Like it's, it should not have worked, but somehow it did. Wow. But yeah, so, for most of my life, I had only had two boyfriends my entire life so people also find that shocking that I'm a porn star who ha only had two boyfriends to me it's not that shocking because I have a similar scenario so <laughs> yeah I think it's weird like pe people think like oh you've probably had so many and all these types of experiences and blah 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 it's just like we're all still just individual human beings with their own stories to tell like well and i love to like people would ask me like how did you get so good at blowjobs you must have blown a lot of guys and i'm like no i blew one guy a million times and that's yeah. how I got good at it. yeah exactly yeah and i i had that happen one time too or uh, i had a brief period of being not attached to somebody and i think i hooked up with a couple male porn stars and one of them was like, God, how can you suck dick so good when you only do girl, girl porn? I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm keeping my hidden secret talent. <laughs> You're like, it's too good. It would ruin the world. Exactly, exactly. Can't, can't unleash this on the whole world. It's not fun. <laughs> so yeah, but you raised an interesting point about polyamory and that that is your, that's part of your sexual identity, it sounds like. Um, wh when did you realized that that was a thing and it had a title and um, was a part so, of this world or an option. <laughs> it, it was definitely later in life, like much later than I had been practicing it because it's one of those things where I have so many experiences that I just never had language for. And exactly. so like in high school, I... Hello and welcome to the Sage Advice Podcast. Today we have a very special guest. It is Ariel Aquinas. Hi. Hello. Thank you so, so much for coming and being on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. It's so good to see your face again. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> So why don't we start by you can describe a little bit like what you've done with regards to the sex industry and sex work. Uh, I had started out just like a regular model, but I knew that I wanted to be a fetish model. I knew I had wanted to be like an alt 
porn model because back you know when I was coming up that was kind of like what was really in at that time is the you know alt girl websites and that was the first time I'd ever seen women who looked like me being portrayed as sexy and beautiful because when I was growing up in the you know early 90s early 2000s it was still kind of the the regular Pam Anderson, Pam Anderson, Jenny Jameson, that skinny, big boobs, body type, blonde, which is so funny because now I'm blonde with big boobs. But, <laughs> but <laughs> never I saw that coming. Huh? I did not <laughs> see that coming. But at the time, I was a weird goth kid, and so to see weird goths, you know, being sexy and beautiful, and the fact that people were paying to see them just really like changed my entire perception of myself. So I started out doing that. Uh, I think the first website I was on was bellavendetta.com, which was like one of those self-submit websites. And it was all kind of fetish content and I'm still friends with her to this day, you know, but that site's long gone. Um, and then I'd moved on to doing like little fetish videos and I was a professional dominatrix for many years. And then I started working for a spanking website because at the time I had this really huge ass and huge, huge asses on white girls were like not even a thing yet. So, yeah. the, the, you know, the spanking websites, you know, really wanted me. And then I started doing cosplay and parody porn. And that's where, you know, it really kind of took off and I got into mainstream porn from there. And what are you doing now? I mean, are you still participating in mainstream porn at all? Or do you have your own things going on? Like what's your status kind of? So right now my status is semi-retired. I haven't what? done any partnered scenes in I think almost two years. I don't even shoot a lot. Like I just don't like being on video right now. So I do a lot of sexting. I do um, dancing for like private bachelor parties here in Vegas but I'm not doing any filming right now. Yeah, like content. Right, yeah, no no content, especially with other people. Yeah, so uh, still keeping your f at least one foot in the sex work style of making money, but not really in performance. Right, I, I love the industry. I didn't wanna leave. Um, and I never expected, you know, to leave. It was kind of circumstances outside of my control forced me to stop <laughs> filming. And so, you know, it's learning to navigate life now, not doing the thing that I had been doing for, you know, like most of my adult life, but then, you know, also, you know, finding out what life is like outside of doing porn specifically, but still being in the industry that I'm comfortable with and that I've been in for so long. So, you know, I, I definitely would probably keep a foot in the industry forever <laughs> if I can, if, you know, the government <laughs> credit card companies, you know, let us exist yeah. much longer. Right. Yeah. It's, it's very frustrating. <laughs> yes, general. absolutely. Uh, the crusaders, uh, people crusading against the type of, joy that we like to bring the world. Um, <laughs> That's a great way to put it, too. Yeah. <laughs> but um, so, yeah, so you're still uh, you're still doing your own stuff. I mean, do you have your own like uh, OnlyFans type thing? You mentioned Sex Panther. Yeah. So I have OnlyFans. I have many vids still. Um, I don't mm -hmm. update them super, super often. It's more uh, you know, I'm using it as like an archive of all of my old stuff. You know, I've still got hundreds yeah. and hundreds of old photos and videos up and a way for fans to talk to me and contact me and buy, you know, I'll send out care packages and stuff. I'm sending out like Christmas care packages, you know, right now to fans. And so that's a way, you know, for them to contact me because my, my DMs, just like most people, my DMs are closed everywhere because if they weren't, it would just be, I'd be answering messages all day long and I'd never get anything yeah. else done. Cause I did that yeah. for years. I did that for years and I finally had to be like, okay, I can't, you know, I can't handle the mental labor of answering messages 24 hours a day. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty much impossible. It's, it's always surprising to me. <laughs> 
like on my OnlyFans, you know, I'll maybe message someone once and then I'm like, oh, I got to go like live my life for a couple of days and then come back to OnlyFans. And there's like a question mark, two question marks. Yes. What happened, baby? Question mark. Another question mark. Oh, are you mad at me? Did I say something wrong? <laughs> Just like, oh, oh and it, it'll be like four <laughs> o'clock in the morning. And I'm like, I got to yeah. sleep, my guy. <laughs> Exactly. I like, no, it's just that wherever you live, I live in a different part of the world. And like, also just, I, I have a life too. Like I, yeah, I I'd love if I was, I got if I was just, a, yeah. Like I, I would love to just be a robot for your sexual needs at every waking moment, but I am not. So <laughs> yeah, literally that's one of my exact fetishes, but <laughs> I, it's a fantasy for a reason. You know, I like to go back a little bit and let's start with how, at what point in your life did you realize or how did you realize like that pornography was a thing? Like what was your introduction to that? So my very first introduction to pornography, I, I was pretty young and a friend of mine had found one of her dad's videotapes because I'm old. So he, he had videotapes and it was called like Sugar Bitches. And, Ooh, sugar bitches. Yeah. And it was this old, like, it had to be from the 70s. Everyone was real furry. Yeah. And I believe it was a bisexual, like, male, male, female threesome video, which I think took me many years to wrap my head around because I didn't know that that was even possible. <laughs> you know, at the at the time, I had no idea. And yeah. It's so funny because now I've had so many male, male, female, by three songs. That's like my yeah. favorite thing in the world. And I always wonder, like, is it because of sugar bitches that I love it? But it was one of those things. We thought it was going to be like a comedy movie because it had a funny title. And we sugar put it bitch. on. And the first thing we see, it's this close up of like super hairy genitals, like pounding into each other. And we didn't know what it was. And we just start screaming, like very classic, like, ah, and we turn it off. And then we kept, you know, like, and then she'd be like, I'm going to turn it on. I'd be like, no, don't turn it on. And then she'd turn it on and we'd be like, ee, you know. <laughs> yes. And, you know, and so it took me a long time to like, it took us a long time to figure out like what we were seeing. And then even yeah. when, you know, like they zoomed out and I saw all three of them going at it, I was like, how is the guy reaching the girl from behind that guy? You know, right. like I just couldn't, uh -huh. you know, figure out what I was seeing. So that was my very, very first, very first, like, porno video. And was it, I mean, you mentioned it's a little shocking, kind of, but was it intriguing at the same time? Like, because personally, I do think that that probably has some influence on the fact that you enjoy boy, boy, girl, threesome videos, right? It was, it was scary, but yeah, it was intriguing in the fact that we could tell that this was something we were not supposed to see. Right. And were you afraid of getting caught in, the, in that moment? Like, I, I don't think we were afraid of getting caught. I think her okay. parents weren't home for some reason, but yeah. it was one of those things where like, she would like, I remember she called, I went home and she called me on the phone and she was like, there is something happening like it was like this girl is sucking two wieners at once back to see that. and i was just like two wieners at once how is it possible you know like i just couldn't believe it yes. so of course i had to walk back over to her house so i could see the two wieners at once happening because i, I mean, just couldn't imagine it yeah you have to see to believe right <laughs> absolutely and now, ever since, I have sucked two wieners myself, so I can tell you for sure it's a real thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've, I've, I've at least seen it once or twice. <laughs> <laughs> so from there, like, what was your, you, I would assume or imagine that maybe you experimented at some point before you decided to get into this kind of work yourself or before you were old enough to do so. Um yeah, well, like your your personal exploration of your sexuality and what sort of led you to be an exhibitionist, I will say. <laughs> Can you so, tell a little bit about that? Absolutely. Well, so I've always been a performer. I was. Yeah, tell like, me about that. 
I was always like a theater nerd. I was in all the plays, like from elementary school on. I was in every single play. I was yes. on the speech and drama team. I have always, I always wanted to be an actor. And so, Same. You know, yeah. so I always tell people, I'm like, technically I did fulfill my childhood dream. <laughs> and- Ariel. Just, hold on a second. I just have to say that you are the f- only other person who's ever said that to me because like I say that too, because when I was a kid, I was just like, I, I'm going to be a porn star when I grow up. That's what I'm going to do. Like when I, seriously, when I was in like middle school and yeah. I, and I always say, I'm like, I'm like the only person I know that grew up to do exactly what I wanted to do with my life. And you're the only other person that has ever said that to me. So uh, no, hell yeah. I, I have heard that. Time Solidarity. Time. I have heard that time and time again, but no, oh, I, wow. even when I was, you know, I think 12 or 13 and I know I'm not the only one with this exact experience. There was an episode of the original CSI and it had a dominatrix named Lady Heather. And I remember seeing that when I was in middle school and I was like, oh, that's what I want to do when I grow up. I want to be a dominatrix. You know, yes. like, I, you because know, it was like the first time I was like, oh, that thing that's in my mind that I want to do, that's a real thing that people do. Oh, I'm going to yes. do that. And so I knew from you know, middle school, I was like, I'm going to be a dominatrix. That's what I'm going to do. Hell yes. And then... I decided to be like, not necessarily in porn, but doing adult content when I was around 16, I Mm -hmm. think, because like at the time there was this big divide between like, yes, I'm posting my nudes online for men to jerk off to, but it's not porn because Mm -hmm. X, Y, Z reason, you know, and eventually we all had to get over ourselves and be like, yeah, we're doing yeah. <laughs> like, like yeah, we're doing porn, but um so yeah, it was so I my first sexual exploration was pretty, you know, I guess it was pretty weird, but also pretty simple. It would just be like watching Girls Gone Wild commercials in the middle of the night, you know, and like kind of like I would just like stick anything in my vagina to see if it did something. I, you know, Hell yes. like, those and did it? No, it did nothing. Like, you know, I know, like plastic play food, a pencil, yeah. like just whatever. I was just sticking stuff in there because I didn't know how masturbation worked. And actually, Same, yeah. people find it really bizarre, but I was never able to make myself come until I was in my like late teens, like 16, 17 years old. I couldn't figure yeah. it out forever. Yeah. And it was actually porn. That helped me figure it out because I, well, because number one, I also didn't know about like clit stimulation versus internal. I thought that internal was just like what it was. And I even like, I had a boyfriend who had like made me come from oral, but I still couldn't figure it out myself. And then one day, because you know, you get like spam emails, like a lot in the early 2000s, all these spam porn emails. And I was looking yeah. at one and there was a video and a girl stuck her hand in her panties and started kind of like rubbing herself. And I was like, oh, I'm getting the feeling, like the feeling mm-hmm. like when I'm with my boyfriend and I'm like going to come, like I'm getting that feeling. So yes. I, I just watched that video over and over and kind of like rub myself and it happened. And I was like, oh. and once I figured it out, <laughs> I did not stop. And, and this was back in the day when like your only computer was your family computer in the living room. So I yep. had to have it like timed out perfect where like I get home, jerk off a few times, like make sure that the screen is blank by the time my mom opens the door. Like, yeah, I would also I would jerk off to all kinds of stuff. I had this like I'd found this book at my grandma's house and it was like it was a textbook. It was like the history of erotic like fantasy or something and or it, the history of erotic literature. And so it was all these mm. dirty stories from like Victor- Victorian times. And I would try and jerk off to that. Like, oh, that sounds hot. Hell yeah. <laughs> Quizilla, I love that. There, there was this website, Quizilla, where you could take these quizzes, but sometimes they would like tell a dirty story. I'd try and jerk off to that. Like yeah. w- two second clips, you know, of like girls eating each other out, just like whatever I could get my hands on. I was trying to jerk off to it. I was obsessed. Yes. It sounds like we're the same age, but yeah, it was the same. Like it was the one family computer and was very, very slow, of course, but (laughs) 
when the internet first came around, it was like my parents had no fucking clue what that was all about. And oh, so yeah. <laughs> it was the wild west back then. Yeah, it was the wild west. So I was like, they'd be in bed and they're like, okay, you have fun on the internet. We're going to bed. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. Oh, and I did. And I'm I having fun. did. <laughs> Honestly, thank God. And I'm actually really grateful. So this kind of leads into the next phase. So when I was like 16, 17, I had my high school sweetheart and he was the guy I lost my virginity to. And he was like, a, he was obsessed with porn and he had all kinds of weird kinks, even though he was a virgin too. So yeah. like, my first sexual experimentation was like real weird, like role play kind of stuff. And, wow. Yeah. Really, Advanced. Oh, yeah. Really, really strange role play. And then, you know, and the first thing I learned was like how to deep throat because he was like, well, this is how the girls because all he knew about sex was from porn. And I, know. I remember I got really jealous because I was like, he has a girlfriend. Why does he need to look at other women? Why does he need to jerk off to porn when he's got me and I have sex with him maybe once a month? You know, why does he? Yeah. Get... <laughs> and please so, explain why. <laughs> and so I find, you know, I finally I got brave one day and I was like, I'm going to look it up to see why these girls are so much better than me. And it was like, suicide girls or god's girls or something and that's mm -hmm. when i was like these girls are me oh yes. my god and i had always thought i was so ugly i had always you know i never thought i was like sexy i never thought people would find me attractive and so to see these women you know like i said being portrayed as sexy and sexy enough that people want to pay for it totally changed my perception of myself like yes. i had no self-esteem and all of a sudden I was like, holy crap, like people might find me attractive and I might be, you know, like worthwhile, you know, and like I might be yeah. sexy and people might desire me like, you know, it never had literally never occurred to me in my life, like ugly duckling for sure. And so I kind of decided right then I was like, okay, I'm going to do this because I want other people to have that moment where they see me on screen and they're like, hey, that's me. You know, yeah. like, yeah. Uh, so, you know, it was, and it, people were, all, when I would do inter, uh, interviews for years and years, people would get disappointed because they wanted a salacious, like, why did you get into porn? And they wanted me to be like, just because I love dicks, you know, and not, I'm so horny. <laughs> yeah. And not, you know, like, I want to give little girls self esteem. <laughs> yeah, totally, totally. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, of course, uh, I think that's for, for a lot of us. Um, getting into this type of work was just a revelation in a lot of ways because, you know, I think we all have insecurities all throughout our life, but mm -hmm. when we get into this type of work and it's like, but here are all of these people reaching out to me, wanting me and telling me that I'm pretty and all this other stuff and uh, have like sexual value and sort of opening my eyes to that in ways that like I couldn't do on my own. Like you can't do it just looking in the mirror, judging yourself, but other people telling you like, not even just telling you like, oh, you're so pretty, but just like wanting you and showing that. Absolutely. And I mean, that was really crucial for me. I mean, you know, obviously like I don't base my entire validation on people finding me attractive, but of course, as being, I was the funny fat friend my entire life. I remember <laughs> One of my friends in middle school, uh, he was asked to pick who he would date between me and my friend. And instead of just picking, he made sure to add on that he would rather jump in front of a train than date me. Uh, wow. You know, so it was like people had been really cool to me, re you yeah. know, like really made me feel super, super ugly my entire life. So to finally, like, I, I kind of needed that outside source of people being like, no, you're attractive because it was just so hard for me to believe because I had been told the exact opposite my entire existence. Yeah, totally. So now, so now you have this, you've, well, did you, I'm just curious now about the boyfriend thing. Like, did you get beyond that feeling of getting jealous when that he would jerk off to people who were not you. Yeah. Yeah. Or... I, once I started jerking off to porn, I really couldn't be mad at him about it. <laughs> so, you know, we, we 
got chill on that. And the funny thing is, like, I am naturally polyamorous. I've always been polyamorous in my relationships, literally since, like, I had a little boyfriend in kindergarten. He had another girlfriend, and we were cool with it. But yeah. it was, but it was like with my first boyfriend, it was like that expectation that I should be jealous. And right. so I was, because it was also kind of a status thing where he had never dated anyone but me, not because people didn't want to date him, because he was like the king of the goths. He was beautiful. Like everybody wanted him so bad. And he had never been interested in anyone until he met me. Like people wow. thought he was gay. You know? So like I felt really special. And then to find out like actually he was attracted to other people, then that was kind of a hit to my ego. But right. No, yeah, we we eventually moved past that and had a very strange relationship up until I my freshman year of college when I literally met my husband. My high school sweetheart sat in front of me. My husband sat behind me. And, Aww, yeah, that's and so cute. it just so happened like the way the numbers worked out that my husband was my study buddy for the class, and I asked him if he wanted to come over and study, you know, come over to my dorm and study, and he didn't leave for fifteen years. So, oh my God, <laughs> we've literally lived together since our like first date. Like it's, it should not have worked, but somehow it did. Wow. Yeah, so for most of my life, I had only had two boyfriends my entire life. So people also find that shocking that I'm a porn star who ha only had two boyfriends. To me, it's not that shocking because I have a similar scenario. So <laughs> Yeah, I think it's weird. Like pe people think, like, oh, you've probably had so many and all these types of experiences and blah blah blah. It's just like we're all still just individual human beings with our own stories to tell. Like, well, and I love to like people would ask me like, how did you get so good at blowjobs? You must have blown a lot of guys. And I'm like, no, I blew one guy a million times, and that's yeah. how I got good at it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I, I had that happen one time too, where uh, I had a brief period of being not attached to somebody. And I think I hooked up with a couple male porn stars and one of them was like, God, how can you suck dick so good when you only do girl, girl porn? And I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm keeping my hidden secret talent. <laughs> You're like, it's too good. It would ruin the world. Exactly, exactly. Can't, can't unleash this on the whole world. It's not fun. So yeah, but you raised an interesting point about polyamory and that that is your that's part of your sexual identity, it sounds like. Um, wh when did you realize that that was a thing and it had a title and um, was a part so, of this world or an option? <laughs> it was definitely later in life, like much later than I had been practicing it because it's one of those things where I have so many experiences that I just never had language for. And exactly. so like in high school, I pretty much exclusively dated women in high school. That's why I only had the one boyfriend because I only dated women. Oh, okay. Well, this opens up a different yeah. chapter. Oh, well, so, so you identify as queer somehow or bi? Yeah, or I'm, I'm queer, definitely. Pansexual, probably. Uh, okay, great. The most accurate, but I would date women and they would have boyfriends. And I was like, well, yeah, obviously I have a boyfriend, you know, like, <laughs> and, yes. I, and I never interacted with these men, you know, mm -hmm. like I, I maybe met them, you know, a couple of times, but like, we weren't in a relationship together. It was just, yeah. we were just dating the same chick. And that was the extent of that relationship. And it just seemed normal yeah. to me, like. Of course, a bi chick is going to have a boyfriend and a girlfriend. Like, you know, duh, that's obvious. <laughs> you know, it just never seemed weird. And then it was, you know, after I got out of high school, then that's when I learned that polyamory was a thing. And I was like, oh, that's the word for the thing that I've been doing my entire life. Okay. Yeah. Well, I guess you've been with that same partner for a really long time, but there's mm -hmm. got to be other sort of difficulties around polyamory. Um, have you had some stumbling blocks? Uh, along the way, uh, you yeah, know, what, I mean, what advice would you offer for people who are realizing that they probably are poly? So it's definitely easier now, as all things are with the internet and the spread of information. Because um, at the time when I was kind of realizing it, I didn't have any examples of what polyamory would look like. Um, yeah. I, I knew no one really in my personal life who had had, you know, a successful polyamorous experience outside of swinging 
But right. my husband and I kind of quickly realized that swinging wasn't the thing we were looking for. Uh, yeah, because we're both just not super into casual sex, as ironic as that is for someone who has sex with people on camera. Right. That I'm not <laughs> in a relationship with. But yeah. in, my, in my private life, I do typically like to, you know, be in a relationship with somebody and fuck one person consistently because that yeah. way they know what I like. You know, they know I don't have to teach oh, yeah. somebody new every time. Right. I, I like the consistency. Um, mm-hmm. So that did take a while of trial and error to figure out a lot of jealousy to work through because we're all trained to be jealous. Even if we aren't naturally jealous, we're trained like we're supposed to be that way. We yeah. really, we didn't open up a relationship until after we got married. Cause once we were married, we're like, well, what are you going to do? Leave? You know, like we're like, no, yeah. you're stuck. You know? So it gave me enough of a sense of security that I was able to open up. And that's something that I tell people a lot is, you know, when you're looking to expand your relationship, make sure that your primary relationship is rock solid. And so it kind of leads into modern day where my husband and I did have difficulties last year and we were separated um, a period of time living separately because we had taken the security of our primary relationship for granted And it was very much a, well, you'll just always be there, you know, it'll be fine. And Mm -hmm. we were focusing pretty much exclusively on our secondary relationships, trying to make them as solid as our primary relationship, while the primary relationship was completely eroding under, you know, because of the neglect. Yeah. I mean, it still takes a lot of work and nurturing, right? I mean, I, I feel like all relationships, friendships, whatever the case may be, like, There has to be some nurturing there from time to time. Absolutely. And it got to the point where, you know, he would like be, you know, he's supposed to hang out with me. He's supposed to have Thanksgiving with me and his girlfriend would have a crisis. And so he would, you know, have to leave. And it's like, if we were in a healthy space, that wouldn't, he would have realized she's doing this on purpose. You know, she's acting out in a destructive way instead of just kind of taking for granted oh well my wife will be okay if i leave on thanksgiving to go hang out with my girlfriend and at the same time i was in a relationship with a very abusive man who wouldn't let me go home and yeah you would in fact hold me captive at his house but i you know i'm a good actor i was able to (laughs) lie and i I'm not known for lying. So my husband just kind of took me at my word. Yeah. And, and what I said was happening and he, you know, was dealing with his girlfriend's problems and really didn't have time to deal, you know, with what I had going on. And, you know, so it was a really, really unhealthy, destructive period of time that would have been solved if we would have been closer in our primary relationship instead of basically being roommates who had two separate relationships. Yeah. So you were able to come back together with him, though. Uh, Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, And it took it did take him leaving me and living alone and being with this other woman to realize, oh, actually, Ariel's not so bad. (laughs) (laughs) I I really wasn't so bad. But, you know, I understand, like, the fallout of me escaping my abusive relationship was traumatic for everyone, not just me. Yeah. It was a yeah. lot to deal with. And at the time she seemed like, you know, the less stressful option, but then he quickly realized that was not true. She, she was pretty stressful as well. Yeah. So we were able to get back together and it's been so beautiful and healthy since because we put in the effort and I was, I was literally just telling yeah. him this this morning. I was like, thank you for showing me that you love me every single day. Like he really goes out of his way it's like we're dating still and that's the way it always should have been it you know we have date nights now we had stopped doing date nights unless it was with other people and yeah giving each other gifts that aren't just something you know we bought for the house you know like right uh and really taking care of each other and spoiling each other and then making sure that the other person knows like i appreciate this so much and not taking it for granted. Like, well, of course you're going to take care of me when I'm sick. Of course you're going to do this. Like, thank you so much. You know, it really goes a long way. 
Yeah, it it sounds to me like you literally just mentioned just about every single love language. It <laughs> sounds like you're working the love languages. I mean, and you kind you kind of have to in a way. Yeah. Like just oh no, you have to <laughs> just because you know my love language is one thing does not mean that you know I'm gonna reject everything else. Totally. I I want it all and I want to give it all because he deserves to have every single bit of that love and be saturated mm -hmm. in it. You know. Yes. And then when you give it out because, you know, your partner deserves it, it's just it, like it returns to you, you know, tenfold and it feels Absolutely. so amazing. And I feel like my little soapbox here, but I feel like everyone, the five love languages is such a powerful tool. It's such an incredible book. Um, there's an unfortunate religious tone to it. Time to yeah. time that pops in. Uh, and But, you know, I feel that the tool itself is so powerful and strong that it's very easy to let go of the little religious stuff that he throws in there sometimes and just focus on, you know, the meaning of those languages and how you can use them as a tool to connect with your partner and to have a stronger relationship. I think it's just so, so powerful. Yeah, just hearing how you talked about it and it's like it just came out like you weren't even talking about the love languages but just the way that you're talking about like you know um appreciating your relationship with your partner it was all those things and i just oh i find it so like meaningful and beautiful and a uh, way to like really connect it's also just so ironic that you're talking about like the religious undertones of things and because i am an ordained reverend and i am what do they call it in <laughs> XXSGN, you know, like a Christian, but with the triple X, like, even, ah. though, even though, you know, I do differentiate that Christianity was the religion that I was raised in. That's my social religion. It's not necessarily my personal spirituality. I'm much more Unitarian, but that's what I went to school for. I went to school for philosophy and religious studies, and I'm a religious porn star, which people think is bizarre. But one of the main tenets that I tell people is you know, you can take these things that are religious and just break them down to their core values and use those core lessons because that's what's important. The dogma that's stacked on top of it, that's less important. But you look at the universal truths, the thing that's the things that span every religion and, you know, focus on what every religion from the beginning of time has thought was important. Just focus on that. And that's really what's in, important. And you can use whatever dogma you want, if that's a way that helps you, you know, facilitate these lessons. But I also don't think that there's anything wrong with picking and choosing, you know, oh. taking a little something from Judaism and taking a little something from Hinduism, you know, whatever yeah. feels right to your soul and helps you process these messages. That's what's important, far more important than being militant in any religion, you know, any religious practice. Yeah. That's, that's when it becomes dangerous. It doesn't matter what religion you are. That's when it becomes annoying. Even if yes. you're an atheist, if you're a militant yes. atheist, it's so annoying. Yes. So you yeah. know, everything in moderation and just use what's useful. Everything else, let it go. A hundred percent. Like I, I agree with you so much, but uh, I was just a little surprised. Like I knew that you kind of went by the reverend, but I wasn't I guess I thought it was kind of like a tongue in cheek thing. So everybody does. You're, everybody does. You're, <laughs> Everyone's like, they think it's ironic. But then I like point out, like I'm covered in like all religious tattoos. And I'm like, I don't take irony that seriously that I would like <laughs> myself out, like just for like the laughs. <laughs> like, no, I, I am religious, but I'm not like strictly Christian. You're not dogmatic. I'm not You're religious, dogmatic. but not dogmatic. My yeah. my tattoos are all Catholic. I've never been a Catholic. They just have the good art. <laughs> like Protestants don't have any good art stuff. <laughs> so, but now I'm just curious because I also am like deeply interested in um, philosophy and religion. When you say that, well, the way you described it, it sounds like well, you said Unitarian. Yes. Um. So you feel as like a non-denominational, right? But like Christian God, like Bible God? Yeah, or so the church that I was raised in primarily, I had been to like a few over my life, but the one that I mainly went to was a non-denominational Christian church. Mm -hmm. And so they didn't put like too much of a spin on things. They were just like, this is what it says. And it was, it's known as a like, come as you are church. So, you know, I could 
wear, you know, my baggy black goth outfits and it wasn't weird, you know, and there were people yeah. at the church with, you know, blue mohawks and the pastor wore jeans and flip flops and it was very chill. And so I think because I had such a laid back religious upbringing, that's part of why I don't have necessarily the same religious trauma that most people do in regards yeah. to the church. I do have religious trauma, but that's, <laughs> that's just from my family. So, right. So yeah. that's not from the church. I had a good church experience. So it wasn't something that like, I felt the need to like necessarily reject when I became an adult, but from being in school and learning different perspectives, um, cause my focus was comparative religion, comparative philosophy, comparative mythology. And, yeah. you know, it broke it down in a way that I could see it as, oh, all of these religions are telling the exact same stories. Mm -hmm. It's the exact same myth. They're just telling in a yep. different way. And so if it's the same, then I really have no standing and no one has the standing to be like, oh, they're all the same, but this one's the most right, <laughs> you know, like it just didn't make any sense to me. So I yeah. think that as far as the ancient religions go, they all have their validity. I can't speak much yeah. for the like new age cults, but ancient religions, I feel that they all have some sort of validity. And so I take, you know, bits, you know, I, whatever wisdom they have for me, Right. That, you know, like relates to me and feels good to me, then, you know, I can take those teachings, but I don't want to just like slap my label on like, but this one's the right one because yeah. I, because I'm a philosophy major and I know that I don't know. <laughs> exactly. I, I know that I don't know anything. And if there is this all knowing on omnipotent being, then I don't have the hubris to even guess what they might be thinking or you know, feeling about any certain thing. So I just do what yeah. feels right and what feels like a universal truth, you know, because yeah. maybe the, that's a truth that was divinely put into all beings and it's part of our genes, you know, to, to all think the same thing. If that's true, then that's amazing and that's important. I think it's fascinating. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's why I studied it. And yeah, uh, yeah so my view is a, a lot more broad than a lot of people think, but that's part of why it's so important for me to put out in the forefront that I'm a religious porn star because I'm exactly the thing that people think can't exist. And right. I love being a thing that people think can't exist. You know? <laughs> I love being that <laughs> mythical cryptid of a, of a yes. human being. Um, and I also, you know, I've done... Uh, podcast before where I talk about the fact that I in fact think what I do is more religious mm -hmm. because I am I, I spend my life loving people showing people love providing people love who might not normally get it because yes a lot of people don't like to think about this but handicapped people jerk off yep. disabled people jerk off yeah and you know, they might not have access to, you know, people say, well, why don't you get a girlfriend? Well, maybe they can't. That doesn't mean yeah. that they should never feel intimacy. It doesn't That's mean that they not. don't have sexuality. Yeah. And so that was something that I had actually, I learned about, I, my, my mom had told me stories about things, which I know she didn't think that I would contextualize them this way, but she <laughs> would tell me about like nurses in other countries who would like jerk off patients who were, you know, who couldn't do it themselves, but it was a part of their like service because they knew that they needed to ejaculate, you know, to be yeah. healthy, to have healthy prostates and stuff. Yep. Or um, she knew this prostitute that would come in a store that she worked at and she would cater, they had a, a home for the disabled and she would cater to the home because, you know, most people, I guess, yes. wouldn't, you know, wouldn't do it or wouldn't think so. But she knew they need those people need those things. And I remember yes, being a do. kid and being like, that is so noble. That is so nice. Yeah. That it, you know, that is wonderful that you are providing this thing that other people wouldn't even think of. So or it, they'd think of it and immediately dismiss it because along with, uh, you know, 
in this country, our puritanical view of all things sexual. Mm -hmm. You know, we we also infantilize disabled people. We, we look at them and it's like, oh, well, you're basically a child. So, but Absolutely. then they have a, they often have a fully adult developed mind and body and have, you know, needs and deserve to have those needs met like anyone else. Yeah, there's a, there's a disabled sex advocate on Twitter. Uh, he goes by Andrew Gerza. Um, and he actually even designed a sex toy that can be used by people who uh, are lacking in ability to even like use their hands a certain way or okay. move their body in a certain way. So definitely um, look up Andrew Gerza on Twitter for more information about that sort of thing. And then um, another thing that really opened my eyes to this, I saw this movie probably 20 years ago. Uh, is called The Sessions with Helen Hunt. Ooh. And um, the male actor, gosh, he's famous too. I can't think of his name. I'm an asshole. But um, it's a beautiful story about someone who is a sexual surrogate, which is something that is obviously illegal in this country, but it's right. thankfully still work that's being done. Um, and that is, you know, so the, it's the story of this guy who's basically he's bed bound like he can't move any of his body i think he can move his head maybe a little bit and that's completely it and so he just gets left lying in a room by himself all freaking day and so he he hires the, the, helen hunt and she's the woman she comes in and it's not about it's just it's different from just hiring a sex worker to come and fuck you right it's done in a totally different way with a totally different mindset it's not just done one time it's like they get to know each other um, it's like exploring together what is possible for the disabled person. And it's just such a beautiful story. Like it had me in tears. And I was like, this is important work that people need. Like they need their humanity validated in this way. And just because it's sexual does not mean that it's not important. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I do feel like that's important like you said to have that experience of just seeing what it could be like i think that that's important for a lot of people even like going back to what i was talking about with polyamory i had mm -hmm. no idea what that would even look like and yeah. it really took just kind of like a random experience where this girl came and stayed at my house and then she just like fit like she had always been there and she didn't yeah. stay, she didn't stay for very long but it was just a moment of like, oh, this is how that could work. It just functioned really smoothly, really well. You know, like I was like, oh, the yeah. kindergarten taking turns, you know, has finally paid off. And, <laughs> you know, it, it, yes. you sometimes you just do need those e e examples. And like I have, I have clients who are severely autistic. They've never had a relationship. And so even just having me to practice talking to a girl yes, is super crucial, super important for them. And I'm a very blunt person. So being able to tell them directly, okay, don't, don't do that, you know, or don't yeah. say stuff like that. Or like, it doesn't work that way. They need that because yeah. typically normal, typical people will not tell you things straight up no. and I it's know. so confusing. And so, you know, to be able to be like, you know, yes, no, yes, no, it, it's really right. helpful for people. So is that something you, I, I want to shift a little bit towards your uh, dominatrix career. Is that uh, something you encounter a, a lot? Um, maybe neurodivergent people, and you work with them in the dominatrix setting? Not too much, but I also don't okay. dom much anymore. I, so I was a okay. dominatrix for years and years, and then I had a very weird midlife crisis thing, <laughs> and I decided to switch my personality entirely. And okay. then I became this like submissive bimbo, <laughs> which ah, was like oh. mm -hmm. the exact opposite of like the big butch dominatrix that I was. So then I had to learn to be submissive. And now I'm just more of a switch. <laughs> I just kind of do whatever, but I don't session much too, ma any, too much anymore because BDSM is illegal in Las Vegas. What? Yeah, it is considered domestic violence. Even if it's well, consensual, even if I say, you know, like punch me daddy, which I have said before, uh, they, they consider it domestic violence. You can get arrested. So there are no like 
real kink oh clubs here. There are barely any kink events. There aren't like a lot of dungeon spaces here. It is yeah. really, well, really I hope. <laughs> I hope the authorities uh, are aware that it's happening anyway. It's definitely it's happening anyway. My dick. <laughs> it's definitely happening anyway. I'm like, fuck you. You tell me what to do in the fucking bedroom. I know. <laughs> so it's so weird. It's so aggravating. There was a great uh, fetish convention here that I used to teach classes at with Danorama from kink.com who used to run kink university. And it was like the Mormons got like the entire convention shut down <laughs> because of purity laws yeah. and obscenity laws, which they're now, you know, of course, trying to beef up uh, yeah, in regards to the industry. That news just yeah. came out recently. So it's just, it's so stressful. Yeah. Yeah, it really is. Uh, but again, we, the main thing to keep in mind is that, uh, you know, they've been fighting against us for thousands of years and yet we remain. So, so true. Amen. We're always going to, we'll always have a way. We will always find a way. <laughs> have you always been based here in Vegas? No, I'm from Cincinnati, Ohio. <laughs> oh, Cincinnati. Okay, cool. Ohioan. So when you were doing dominatrix sessions, you were uh, more like in your 20s? Yeah, I was in my 20s. I had uh, started working for like a fetish performance troupe that was run by Dominatrix. And uh, she trained me uh, and I worked in her local dungeon. Uh, don't recommend, by the way. She, <laughs> really? She is okay. mean. <laughs> and not, not okay. in the fun, she's not in the fun way mean. She's just really yeah. mean. Yeah. And, uh, but I was the cisfication specialist. So my main job was dressing men up like women and uh, teaching them to be good little maids and to be in service yeah. of women, which was yeah. really, really fun. And then really ironic for me because I essentially did the same thing to myself. I was very, like I said, I was butch. I actually identified as a trans man at the time. Oh, wow. I didn't know that about you. Yeah. So when I would dress up, it would be like I was dressing up in drag, which I thought was hot. I yeah. loved it. I <laughs> loved it when girls dressed me up and put makeup on me. I thought it was really sexy. So, you yeah. know, I, as with most of my kinks, I can enjoy it from the top and from the bottom, which makes me an nice. excellent switch. So yep. I, I was very deep into that psychology, which made me a great dom because I knew what a what about the act turned them on because it turned me on and so when i became a bimbo i essentially just force femmed myself and kind of stuck with that ever since so do you identify as a bimbo now i do i well now i think i i think i'm supposed to identify as an elder bimbo because i've been at it for <laughs> so long and now you know like the whole new generation of of these gen z bimbos it's so different than, you know, bimbofication was back in my day. I, yeah. even, I tell people because I had a, an acrylic nail fetish and I used to have mm. to go on like really seedy forums to see pictures of girls with long nails. And now everybody's got That's longer every... Everybody's got longer toes nails. It's like the most boring, basic thing you can think of. Yeah. Back, back in my day, that was like super <laughs> rare. Nobody did. People used to make fun of me. They called me the dragon lady because I had these long nails. Like it was oh, wow. so not a thing. And bimbofication, nobody knew what bimbofication was. It was such yeah. a weird, rare fetish. Like even on, you know, like sites like FetLife where, you know, yeah. everybody's kinky. Nobody had heard yeah. of bimbofication. And so oh my gosh. It, I'm, I've been having this weird experience. Like it's like every few years where it's like one of my deep niche interests or fetishes become mainstream and I'm like, oh, what? You know, like everybody, <laughs> like, like Kate Bush, everybody knows mm -hmm. Kate Bush now. And for years that was like my, you know, like if you're getting stoned with your friends and you're watching weird videos, I'd be like, all right, check this one out. Cause no one had heard of Kate Bush. Yeah, and now, totally. Everybody, my weird niche, and now my weird niche interest is out there. And that's the way it was with bimbofication. Now there's a whole music genre based around my weird niche interest. So yeah. It's like, it's so bizarre. I never saw that coming, but uh -huh. it, I also love it because it makes it easier for me now. I don't have to hunt so hard to find bimbo, you know, items, bimbo clothes, yeah. bimbo yeah. information, fellow bimbos. I've turned all oh, my yeah. friends into bimbos. You'll, if anyone has noticed the uptick in bimbo activity in Las Vegas, 
you're welcome. That's <laughs> all me, baby. That's all me. The Reverend has been preaching the gospel of the Bimbo since 2014. We are, oh, yeah. we are getting it out there. We are making it work, which I appreciate all the people who have been doing the work. People like me who were doing the podcast and the videos yes. and stuff, getting the word out there because we wanted it to be dis- destigmatized because yeah. as, as weird as it is, like men hate, you know, women who are too masculine, but also hate women who are too feminine and it yeah men men hate women yeah men hate women <laughs> that's the gospel truth right there and <laughs> it was nice to have some of that destigmatized and to not be in such constant danger for presenting feminine and presenting sexy because i like to be sexy and honestly i wish more men would himbify themselves. So I, that's what I'm doing, but that's my next job is I'm preaching the gospel of the himbo. I need more yeah. men in crop tops. I need the gray sweatpants. I want you to be slutty, speedo. <laughs> I want to see the dick print. I want to look. Yeah. Guys do not realize that women actually, you know, do want to look at something sexy. We want to see, you know, we have eyeballs. <laughs> <laughs> we want to see something sexy. We like you know, looking at hot stuff. So yeah, that's, that's my that's my mission in life right now. That's my Hell new yeah. thing. I love that. I love I love the gray sweatpants. <laughs> oh my god, gray sweatpants. Season. Something about <sighs> something about gray sweatpants. Like no other color really does it, but the gray sweatpants. It's just oh. there's highlights nice. highlights the bold. And basketball yeah. shorts. Oh, basketball shorts. Oh, man. I can't go to the gym. See, this is why this is a problem in my life. I can't go to the gym. It's too sexy. <laughs> it's, it's too sexy. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So also, you mentioned that here in Vegas, you work for a company that goes out and does um, bachelor parties and stuff like that. So it sounds like your career has always been a little bit of a mix of uh, performance based on camera type stuff and also in person type stuff. So is uh, working for this, um, doing the bachelor parties and stuff like that, is that a big shift for you? Does it feel natural? Like, how is it different from what you're used to? How is it the same? I definitely think it's natural. For me, You know, going back to what we talked about in the beginning, it's like an actor doing film, but also doing stage. And yes. I had done live fetish performance for many, many years. I had done burlesque for many years. And um, so being able to perform for a crowd really wasn't outside of my wheelhouse. So I I really do enjoy getting to perform for an audience and getting to entertain. But my style, you know, is, and it's always been this way, my style is much less, I'm very serious. You know, I've got serious eyebrows drawn on, serious dominated (laughs) eyebrows. You know, I like to have fun. I like to make people laugh. I like to tell jokes. So even when I'm doing burlesque and even when I'm doing shows and even when I'm dancing, I try to add humor in there. Like, you know, the vaudeville performers of old, I try to add, you know, some fun in there. Um, But I'm also, I'm like a clown. I'm a clown fetishist and a clown performer. Oh, yes. I can make balloon animals and everything. So it's also part of that where it's like, I'm a natural clown. I want to be funny when I perform. And I mean, I can do the serious, sexy stuff if it calls for it, but it's more fun for me to be silly. And that's why even in like my porn videos, I will say things that are really bizarre. Like uh, I remember in my gangbang I did for kink.com, there's a moment where I say, you know, like, this is just like being in a porno, you know, like, kind of do it like a fourth wall break. just because I, I, like I like to be yeah. silly, but I love doing the bachelor parties because I'm, I'm not a competitive person. I would never make it in a strip club. They would eat me alive. So I love being able to be like, okay, we're working together as a team to take everyone's yeah. money together, you know, and yes. it's, it's a lot more fun. It's a lot more chill. I get to just hang out with people because sometimes they just want to hang out with hot chicks. I love yeah. that. You know, sometimes we get to play games. I did, I did an event recently where I got to oil wrestle, which is something that I did like way early in my career. I did a lot of wrestling. Mm-hmm. I was on a bikini wrestling team and it, you know, it was, a. Uh, it was so much fun and I just like having fun. I always want to be having 
fun. I mean, what else, what else are we doing here? Like, <laughs> I, think, I think it's actually a Prince quote. Uh, he says, I do nothing professionally. I only do things for fun. And that, also, that stuck with me where I was like, yeah, because I will tell people like, I do not do porn. I never did porn for the money because it does not pay that well. <laughs> So yeah, I started with stripping and I remember people would always be like, oh, you strip because it's, it's easy money. It's easy money. It's easy money. And me and my friends would always be like, it's not easy money. It's, it's fast money, mm -hmm. but it's not easy. Like going out there, walking around, hustling, like trying to find different ways to get these people to part with their money. <laughs> like, Absolutely. That was challenging. And sometimes you're in clubs where they're like, 50 different chicks, you know, or like 80 chicks walking around like the big clubs. They yeah. have so many girls and you are competing with every single one. And in some clubs, and in some clubs, you're also competing with um, alcohol, pool tables, sports mm -hmm. on TV. Like that's why uh, when I was stripping, I actually preferred the nude clubs in California because you weren't competing with any of that shit. Like all they had was soda and naked women. So take your pick. Like, what are you, you know, you came in here for a reason. Absolutely. Yeah. The, no excuses. You know why you're here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What, what else are you doing here? Like, come on, let's do this. <laughs> so the, but the money was fast, um, but you know, it was work. It's definitely work. Um, and it's and still yeah, something it's just... you have to put money into to make money from. Oh, absolutely. And I mean, that's just, gosh, that's most of this industry. It feels like, um, especially right now, now. It, I was just going to say, yeah, right now, like we're dealing with a whole thing with testing and it looks like testing has all already been a whole thing. So I can't remember how long ago it was, but it used to be that you took a test. Gosh, I remember my first test ever was $75. <laughs> I can't imagine. <laughs> but, and it lasted a month and it, and it lasted a month until gosh, I don't know, maybe eight, 10 years ago, maybe, mm -hmm. maybe it was a little more. And it was like, okay, now it's only two weeks. Okay. So it's a hundred, it was $110. Then it went up again. So there was $155 uh, and it lasts only 14 days. And then it's like, well, now there's COVID and you have to add that too. And then that now, okay. So now it's like almost $200 and now we don't have to do the COVID anymore, but they are wanting to add swabs and those are like an extra $60 for each, each one. And right. yeah. And they don't and know if they're do still, they do still like require the COVID. And so it can be, mm -hmm. I mean, and then, and then if you live out of town, cause we, we can only get tested at certain labs. So that's an extra fee to even like get your lab test sent into the database. And so mm -hmm. it ends up being like thousands of dollars a month. To, get, to be able to work and yeah, with, with other people because people are getting paid less because the studios are making less money because of all the pirating the tube sites, which has been a problem for a long, long time. And the whole yeah. phenomenon of people getting paid from tube sites, that is new. That did not yeah. happen for a long and time. And even still, like, it's not a substantial amount. Like yeah. we make a little bit of money every view that is on a video that's ours. Like penny. But it's, yeah, it's like a fraction of a penny. And not only that, I think people will like see me in a video and be be like, well, I'm watching this free on Pornhub, but you're in it. So you're, you're getting money somehow. But no, they, that's yeah, somebody think, else's video. <laughs> they think that there are royalties. There are not. Oh you yeah, take no. it one time, and it doesn't matter if your video gets a bazillion views. You get nothing unless mm -hmm. you have uploaded it yourself and you have like signed yeah. up to be monetized. And you have to own stories. the content. But I want to tell yeah. I want to tell my favorite Sin Sage story because you got me oh. you got me thinking about it because you were talking about like people seeing you somewhere. So one time <laughs> I was like dating this guy and we'd gone to his friend's house and we were like drinking tequila shots. We've been drinking for hours and they liked to make these like cut out collages out of porn magazines. And so I had been drinking like all day. We're doing this craft. <laughs> I can barely hold scissors. And I open a magazine and I see a picture of you in it and I start <laughs> falling and I'm like that's my friend I miss her because I like just moved from Atlanta recently I'm like I've never seen her anymore I miss her so much and then I like called you and I was like I feel like from the bathroom I call Senna but I'm like I missed you I found a picture of you in America and you're so beautiful I love you. Ah! it was so funny it was I was like 
the next day I was just like, oh my God. But it, be it became one of my like very favorite Sim Sing stories because I did miss you so much. Oh, yeah. Ooh, that was when you had just moved uh, to Vegas from yeah, Atlanta? Yeah, from Atlanta because okay. I used to see you like yeah. all the time. And then I, I, know. I didn't see you anymore. And then I saw <laughs> you and I was like, ooh, I miss book And then of course you moved to Vegas, but it's during COVID. So I haven't seen you anyway. I know. I know it was ridiculous. Like we got here and I was like, sweet, we're working all the time. And then it was just like COVID. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, ah, oh, God, what am I doing with my life? But no, Vegas is such a great place in general. I would say I thought we both thought we were going to hate living here. We pretty much just did it to like save some money up and we knew industry was here. Oh my gosh, I really fell in love with it. I just think it's so beautiful. I love that there's always something to do. If you want to do something, you can find something to it's do. something weird to do. It's not just something yes. to do. It's like the weirdest shit you ever heard of. Yes. And it's awesome. Yeah, it's like it's so fun. fun, unique, weird, interesting things going on here all the time. And that's like not not talking about the strip at all like fuck no. the strip like there's just no, so I much other cool out. stuff <laughs> i never yeah there. but no i'm the same as you i i was skeptical i didn't really know much about yeah. vegas my husband had literally never even been here before he moved and we came out and we love it like we feel so yeah. spoiled living here I, yeah. I i go anywhere else and i'm like what everything's closed you mean i can't yeah. get anything i want after 10 p.m like what do you yeah mean? And it's just, it is amazing. There's so much to do. There's so much going on. And just the ease of being able to do things and to get around, you know, yep. ride share is pretty good here. I just and it's really, beautiful. Really and it's beautiful. Like nature wise, like we're surrounded by these the gorgeous mountain ranges and I the sunsets are incredible and when there's I, hikes. Yeah. When I came to visit, I couldn't believe that no one had ever told me that there were beautiful mountains everywhere. I showed yeah. up, I was like, what is that? Oh yeah, me and my husband go to the mountains all the time. It's my favorite yep. place. If I won the lottery, I'd be building a house right up there. <laughs> <laughs> right. I know, and I say all this uh, as I am literally in the process of buying a house in Illinois, so. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah. Moving to a place where everything is definitely closed at probably nine or ten. And cold. But, That's the worst part. Is yeah. like even though I'm from Ohio, I'm acclimated to the warm now, and I could I yeah. can't go back. That's what I tell my husband. I can't go back. I can't. Can't go I'm, back. I'm a lizard person now. I can't do it. Uh, that makes sense. Yeah, I think for me, no. When the other aspect about moving to uh, 